The demilitarized zone. These three words are a standing symbol of the Cold War's last frontier, and a peninsula deeply divided. Also known as the 38th parallel, the 160 miles long and 2.5 mile wide stretch of land that separates North and South Korea, running from the Sea of Japan on one end to the Yellow Sea on the other. This no man's land has been described as the most armed border on Earth, filled with millions of combat ready troops from both countries, landmines, electric fences, watchtowers, and underground tunnels tunnels to defend a border that has never actually existed. Towards the north, China and Russia barricade an already isolated nation, and towards the south, US ally Japan keeps a western-leaning South Korea company. It's the perfect geographic location for a stalemate between opposing powers, and it's been that way for over 70 years. That's why it sounds insane to think of the Korean peninsula as anything other than divided. But what if it wasn't? What if the efforts towards reunification over the past seven decades finally resulted in one Korea? If that wishful thinking came true, unified Korea would be a force to be reckoned with. Think about it this way. It's estimated that a united Korea would have the military might of Great Britain and Japan combined, pull in a GDP of around $5 trillion and hold the position of the world's 10th largest economy with a combined workforce of over 40 million. The North's natural resources and the South's technological advances would skyrocket transportation and infrastructure, creating new industries in a once barren land. A connected railway system would shuttle goods from one end of the country to the other, and clear waterways would export raw materials to the world. It almost sounds utopian, which is why it's been so impossible to achieve. From antagonizing moves like North Korea launching short-range cruise missiles near the South, to the South hosting US nuclear-capable submarines on their coast, this back and forth has been part of divided Korea's history. But it wasn't always like this. A once united Korea enjoyed 13 centuries of unity and forward development, and was known as one of the oldest states of the past 2000 years. Even as they fell to the Japanese Empire in 1910, Korea remained a united state. It wasn't until the end of World War II in 1945, when Japan lost its territory as part of its surrender deal, that Korea was thrown into the hands of the Soviets and the United States. So what did they do with this new territory? Divide it down the 38th parallel, here, with the North supported by the Soviets and the South by the US. It was meant to be temporary, but as the Cold War started, neither the US nor the Soviets wanted to give up their potential ally in the region. By 1950, tensions were high with frequent border skirmishes, and to reunite the country under the North's pro-Soviet rule, President Kim Il-sung, with the backing of then-Soviet leader Joseph Stalin, invaded the South. This kicked off the Korean War, a bloody three-year fight with a death total of 5 million North and South Koreans, Chinese soldiers, and American forces combined. When Stalin passed away, the new leadership raced to find a solution to the constant bloodshed, and an armistice or ceasefire was finally signed in 1953, creating the demilitarized zone, a de facto separation that stands today. This means that North and South Korea are technically still at war, but neither has the intention to engage in active battle, for now. With this tricky balancing act in place, both North and South started off at roughly the same place economically and socially, but each took drastic turns. The Western-backed South benefited from the free markets and open access to learning and global technology, while the North suffocated under the strict regime of the Kim family and a weakening USSR. The 90s were the worst for the North, as a countrywide famine was largely ignored by its own government, leading to the death of 10 to 19% of North Korea's population. In that same decade, the USSR fell, so the North was essentially on its own, though some backing from China did exist. By 1992, South Korea's GDP had increased from $41 million in 1953 to $355 billion. Compare that with North Korea, whose estimated GDP had grown significantly less, to only $12 billion by 1992. That, coupled with failed efforts on both ends to fix problems over the years, and North Korea's betrayal of the 1992 denuclearized declaration signed by both countries, led us to the Koreas we see today. Neither North nor South is ready to fully dive into such a messy process such as unification. And when you consider Japan, China, the US and Russia's roles, well, things get even messier. This doesn't mean the North and South will never unite. I mean, it's literally in their constitution. Reunification is the end game. There are just a lot of obstacles in the way. Like, a lot. For unification to be real, a lot of chess pieces would have to fall into place. And the easiest one to imagine would perhaps be the total collapse of the North. It's a fantasy, of course, but the total collapse of North Korea would be a highly complex and unpredictable event, with various scenarios and outcomes. 
A combination of factors such as economic turmoil, famine, disease outbreaks, internal uprisings, or pressure from external actors like the abandonment of support from Russia and China could flip the nation on its head. First of all, the collapse would mean Kim Jong-un and his regime would be a prime target for the citizens' frustration. After all, countries tossing out their leadership is nothing new. Internal frustration with the regime's oppressive policies and human rights violations may reach a tipping point, leading to a mass uprising by citizens demanding change and an end to the Kim family's rule. And if Kim Jong-un doesn't want to end up like Muammar Gaddafi, he'd surrender. On the flip side, North Korean citizens don't have the unifying factors of the Arab Spring like social media, honest news cycles, and the ability to constantly exchange information or free thought. There's a reason why there have been no major rebellion attempts under Kim Jong-un's rule. The iron hand on North Korea citizens makes igniting a movement nearly impossible. Then there's the brutality. Such an uprising would likely be met with extreme violence, which nobody wants. Maybe an economic collapse would be more likely. North Korea's economy heavily relies on outdated and inefficient systems, giving it a global GDP ranking of 115 and making it the lowest ranking free economy in the Asian Pacific, with more restrictions than Uzbekistan, Cambodia and even Burma. A severe economic freefall could lead to widespread poverty, food shortages and humanitarian crises, putting pressure on the government to regain control or bail themselves out by letting the South step in. The greatest obstacle to this form of collapse would be China and Russia's aid, no matter how weak it is. It's kept the Kim regime alive so far. China's main reason for supporting the North is the country's role as a buffer between them and Western allied Japan and South Korea. The same goes for Russia, who recently vetoed, with China, the 2022 UN security proposal to raise sanctions against North Korea for further developing its nuclear programs. China alone is responsible for 92% of North Korea's trade movement. As long as the government functions as a roadblock in the region for the US and its allies, China and Russia will play ball. The way they see it, ending the current North Korean regime could lead to the emergence of a unified Korea aligned with their Western rivals. And right at their borders too. So allyship is a price they're willing to pay. Unless, of course, there was an internal government struggle. Let's say Kim Jong-un is incapacitated. With no immediate successor, internal power struggles among the ruling elite could bubble over. And who knows which new ruler Russia and China will have to deal with. A destabilized leadership could weaken their regime's ability to control the country, creating factions in the government, with some seeking foreign support or attempting to seize power for themselves. In this mess, the South and its allies could take over. This type of takeover isn't ideal though, as it would leave the North at a great disadvantage, and the burden to return to normalcy would weigh heavily on the South. Unification via invasion isn't much better. In fact, that would be the worst case scenario. North Korea is heavily armed, and any invasion from the South would be met with heavy resistance and unimaginable casualties. So, the best and most realistic road to unification would be a slow and consistent process, with a lot of dialogue and even more compromise on both ends. And here is where things get complicated. See, any modern unification would have to be South-led, as North Korea cannot competently absorb the South's gigantic economic, social and political structure. This would mean Kim Jong-un and his regime would have to surrender huge, influential power or form a joint leadership with the end goal of a singular governing body. It would mean a looser stance on isolationist policies as a trade-off for him avoiding arrest and possible prosecution, which would no doubt cause an international uproar, but keep the efforts toward reunification moving. Secondly, North Korean leadership would have to give up its most valued jewel, nuclear capability. And this won't be easy. After all, it's their greatest asset. They've got nearly 60 nuclear bombs, a collection of short and intercontinental range missiles, and stockpiles of 2,500 to 5,000 tons of chemical weapons. It's the main reason for heavy global sanctions and an equally heavy US military presence in the region. It's part of why South Korea is home to the US's largest overseas military base, Camp Humphreys. But if the North were to honor its denuclearization promises, the US's military presence would be unnecessary, cutting out China and Russia's worries and easing tension with Japan. As a trade-off, South Korea would have to take a neutral political stance, loosening its tight allyship with the West, since a Western-leaning Korea would only annoy Russia and China, creating a new threat. It might even force the two nations to invade the North before reunification is complete. The South would also have to foot the heavy economic bill by developing the North's infrastructure and bringing them up to speed tech-wise, sort of like West Germany did for the East. South Korean giants like Samsung, Hyundai, LG, Kia and many more would gain an immediate source of affordable labor and raw resources, while northerners working for these companies would significantly boost their per capita income. This collaboration would transform Unified Korea into the seventh largest economy in the world by 2050, 
South Korea would also benefit from the 1.1 million combat-ready troops and 7.7 million reserve troops that would ultimately be absorbed into one army, creating a fighting force that combines South Korea's current global military strength ranking of 6th place and North Korea's position of 28th place. But at the same time, due to there being a united Korea, there'd be no need for a compulsory draft anymore like there is in the two countries. So the economy would receive another boost of young workers, at the expense of soldiers. Now, while all of this sounds achievable, one of the toughest aspects of unification would be teaching a divided public to start thinking as one. In fact, this might be the biggest hurdle. Of the 33,000 North Korean defectors living in Seoul today, many report discrimination as the main reason behind a lack of job opportunities and social advancement. North Koreans are smaller in size and have distinctive accents, making them targets for southern biases and prejudice. It's gotten so bad that some defectors have returned to the North. Northerners would also have to learn how to thrive in a free market with fierce competition and no immediate governmental direction in their day-to-day -day lives. This alone would take decades. It's no wonder the South Korean public isn't as optimistic about reunification. A survey from 2021 discovered that while 50.6% of South Koreans felt unification was necessary, they thought it should be held off until circumstances are better. 25.5% didn't even see it as a possibility at all and preferred things the way they were. In fact, only 12.7% thought it should be done as soon as possible. When you think about all of the obstacles, reunification sounds like a huge joke. But that's also what people in the 60s thought about the Berlin Wall one day falling. And the idea of South and North Vietnam as one country was unheard of in the late 50s. So maybe the idea of a united Korea isn't as far-fetched as we think it is today. Constant diplomatic talks and a softened stance on both ends might bring this daydream into a modern-day miracle. After all, stranger things have happened. Thanks for watching.